Welcome to Great Bible Truths with Dr. David Petz. I'm his son, Jonathan Petz, and what you're about to hear is an encore episode from an old legacy podcast we used to do called the David and Jonathan Podcast. And it's all about how to make the most of your daily Bible reading. Originally recorded in 2018, here it is now. Welcome to the David and Jonathan podcast. Good morning, Dad. Good morning. So we've been looking at the importance of reading the Bible, and more particularly, how to make the most of your daily Bible reading. So far, we've been looking at why reading the Bible is important, and we would hope most of our listeners would have a pretty good grasp of that in their heart as well as in their head. Then we moved on to think about how God speaks to us through the Bible. Well worth going back and listening to those if you haven't listened to them. Useful background knowledge followed that podcast. Then we looked at some different types of useful background knowledge, actually. Uh, The books of the Bible, the history, the message of the Bible, the cultural background of the Bible, which is very important to understand. Last week we looked at some aids to Bible study. We talked about which translation we should be using and different study notes and commentaries and things like that. So, is that enough? Have we said enough about reading the Bible and making the most out of your daily Bible reading? I think not. What what are we going to look at today, Dad? Uh, Well, today and over the next few podcasts, we're going to look at the importance of context. You can't understand what the Bible is saying unless you examine the context. Okay, so where are we going to start with that then? Well, we'll look at gen. We'll have an an overview now, and okay. uh, then next one we'll move on to something more specific on context. But um, uh, basically, you have got general context and immediate context. And uh, in terms of general context, I'm talking about historical context, right? And then also literary context. Um, and then there's immediate context. So I just want to summarize those. Um, and then we'll look at them in more detail in future podcasts. Okay. So um, by historical context, we need to ask ourselves when we're reading the Bible, when, where, and why was this passage written? And particularly... Uh, ask ourselves whether we're reading the Old Testament or the New Testament. Okay. Uh, And uh, next time, in fact, we'll probably start today, we'll talk about understanding the New Testament in the light of the Old and the Old in the light of the New. Uh, Then when you talk about literary context, which we will um, consider later, um, the you have to consider something called genre. Genre. Yeah. Sounds so foreign. Well, it's it's a French word and <laughs> pronounced the French way, even in the English language. Um, in other words, many different kinds of writings yeah. that there are in the Bible, Gospels, letters, history, law, prophets, and Psalms. That's relevant to how you understand what's being said. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we'll look at that in a future one. Okay. And then... Thirdly, we will look at the immediate context, how to look at the immediate context of a passage. Okay. Um, So that's basically an introduction or an overall view, uh, uh, an overview (laughs) of uh, what we're going to do over the next few talks. So historical context, literary context and immediate context. Exactly that. Right. Um, So we'll make a start on historical context Mm -hmm. And uh, the main thing I want to do with that is to discuss interpreting the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. And we'll do part of that in this talk and the rest of it um, in the next one, I think, because I suspect it'll be too long to do in one go. Okay, so whenever we read the Old Testament, it's important to remember that it's not God's final revelation to the human race. So as the writer to the Hebrews pointed out, Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. So very, very clearly, 
God spoke in the past, mm-hmm. says the writer to the Hebrews, yeah. by the prophets, the Old Testament, in other words. Yeah. Uh, but now, in these last days, he has spoken finally and definitively by his Son, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and so the important thing to understand is that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of all Old Testament law mm. and prophecy. Mm. What does he say in Matthew five seventeen? Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. So he upholds the law and the prophets. Yeah. But he says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Amazing. So he came to fulfill them. So He's the only one who could. Indeed. <laughs> he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament law, prophets, promises, everything. So if we're his followers, that's going to have an effect on how we view the Old Testament. Absolutely. We're not reading it the way a Jewish audience might read the Old Testament. Indeed. Right. Got it. So... The Old Testament is a revelation of the old covenant that God made with his people. But the Old Testament itself promised that the day would come when God would make a new and better covenant with them. And this is made very clear in the letter to the Hebrews. As Christians, we are not living under the old covenant that God made with the Jewish people, but under the new covenant which is sealed with the blood of Jesus. When Jesus cried on the cross, he declared, it is finished, finished, Mm. which actually I noticed in my daily Bible reading uh, and the comment that was made on it. uh, We know the Greek is just one word, tetelestai. It is finished. (laughs) Um, And uh, that's actually the, the... commentator on my daily bible reading was saying if they had to summarize the new testament in one word what would it be and it was this word finished (laughs) the word finished means accomplished Mm. or completed so when jesus said that on the cross he had completed the work his father had given him to do his death on the cross provided atonement for our sins and was the fulfillment of the all old testament law and indeed of most of its prophecy Uh, (laughs) now i say most of it because jesus is going to come again and some of that's prophesied in the old testament but uh, basically certainly the old of all old testament law and that's why we should always read the old testament in the light of the new Mm. um so that's a very very important principle and listeners need to get that clearly in their heads, as it were. I'm sure many of our listeners have already got it clearly in their heads. But there is always a danger, however well we know these things, when we're reading the Old Testament, to assume that that is God speaking to us, when it may not be, it may be actually what God was saying to the Jews over 2,000 years ago, and not to us today have you got any examples that might help us well um the old testament food laws would be an obvious example of that now that doesn't mean we can't learn anything from those things but it's not something we are under as the jews were back in those days okay so let well let's look at old testament food laws um a good place to start with that would be Leviticus 11, 1 to 8. And it represents the sort of things the Israelites were allowed to eat and not to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll just read it. Um, Leviticus 11, 1 to 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. But there are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof and you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. 
it is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Wow. Well, quite complicated, isn't it? But I think it's fairly clear. The message is that for an animal to be suitable for a food for a dew to eat it must have both both, both requirements. it must chew the cud and have a divided hoof yeah and uh, moses spells this out very very clearly to the people mm-hmm. so what's immediately clear from this is that the eating of pigs and rabbits for example was forbidden We don't need to concern ourselves with why the lord gave moses these instructions What is significant is that the instructions were given to the Israelites. Mm -hmm. But how do we know they don't apply to us today as Christians as well? Mm. Well, that's where we've got to go to the New Testament. And this is what I'm saying about interpreting the Old Testament in the light of the New. Yeah. Um, And so let's go first to Mark 7 verses 14 to 23 and you'll notice what jesus said there again it's quite a long reading but uh, it's important again jesus called the crowd to him and said listen to me everyone and understand this nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. After he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Wow. That's Mark's comment on what Jesus is saying. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within. Out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Hmm. Well, to be honest, I think the meaning of that passage is very clear. What's most significant is Mark's explanation of what Jesus was saying. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And that certainly seems to mean for us that as Christians, there's no such thing as unclean food. Hmm. Wow. But someone's probably going to say, How does that stand up in the light of a passage like Acts 15, 22 to 29? Well, I wasn't going to ask that because I don't know what it What what does it say there? (laughs) (laughs) Whoever's Um, asking that question has got better knowledge than me. Are you going to leave that for next time? Well, let's read it and then then maybe leave it hanging until next time. Have a cliffhanger. Have a think over the week. Okay. Right, so you've... What you've what you've just said is yep. that Jesus has declared all foods clean. Yep. And that that's very clear. And now you're going to bring in a, another New Testament passage that might throw a spanner in the works. Is that right? Indeed. Right, let's hear it. Acts Act Acts fifteen, twenty two to twenty nine. This is where the apostles and elders have gathered in Jerusalem ah. to discuss the question of what requirements should be made of gentile believers yes yeah, because that was a new thing for them yes new christians who weren't jewish and it was particularly to do with the question of circumcision yeah but of course it did involve other things yeah did the gentiles have to obey old testament law yeah. circumcision or what 
Now we know very clearly Paul taught, no, they didn't have to be circumcised. The circumcision is of the heart. But let's see what this passage says. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and then send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization without our authorization, and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Mm. Farewell. Farewell. So it looks as though here is a New Testament commandment for to, to avoid certain food. Christians to avoid certain food. Hmm. So next time, oh. let's ask ourselves the question, does that mean that we should avoid those things? We've got to avoid food, sacrifice to idols, from blood. Yeah. So black pudding's out. Start. And meat, and the uh, meat of strangled strangle animals. animals. Right. Or is there something else in the New Testament that would give us freedom to do so? And if so, why was that teaching there? Right. Okay. So that's that's an interesting thing to think about for a week. So thanks for those thoughts. We've been looking at the importance of context and digging deeper today. Um, next week we'll be continuing with that then and finishing off a little bit more about the Old Testament. In the meantime, have a think about how we would apply Acts 15 in our own lives. Is that, is that alright for today, Dad? Indeed it is. Well, thank you so much. See you next week. Thanks again for listening to the David and Jonathan podcast. If you want to give any feedback or you've got questions, please send them in directly to my dad. You can just email info at davidpets.org and we'll see if we can address those in future podcasts. Speak to you soon.